Now let's talk about a slightly different approach to genetic algorithms called genetic programming, which was developed by John Koza in the 1990s. Genetic programming, instead of using strings of numbers, as we did for Robbie the robot, uses programs represented as what are called syntactic trees. I'll explain that in a moment. Here's a picture of John Koza lecturing on genetic programming. He's written one, two, three books on this subject. It's become a very big sub-area of the field of genetic algorithms. So here's the idea. Let's consider the problem of Robbie the robot again and evolving a control strategy for him. Here, instead of representing his control strategy as a string of numbers which represent actions in every possible situation, here we would represent a control strategy as a sort of tree. This is a, what in computer science is called a tree, where we have the elements of the program represented in terms of these nodes and these branches. So this particular program is an if-then-else statement here at the root. And it says if, this is the clause to consider, if there's a can in the east and the north is empty, then the robot should move east, otherwise the robot should move south. That's what this tree represents, and you can look at it as a regular kind of program. If east equals can and north equals empty, then move east, else move south. Now, suppose Robbie is in this situation, and this is his strategy. Here's what he would do. He would look at the if clause here. He would say, is there a can to my east, and is the north of me empty? Well, there's a can to the east, and the north is empty, so he would follow this first branch. He would move east. There he goes. OK, well, now he's in a new situation. So he follows this strategy again, he says. Is there a can to the east of me and the north empty? No. Then I follow the second branch, move south. Then does it again. Not, there's not a can to the east and the north isn't empty, so move south. So this isn't a very good strategy, but this is what it is for him to follow it. It's a different kind of representation than what we saw before. Obviously, this tree is way too simple to be a good strategy because it doesn't involve picking up any cans. Consider this more complicated strategy, which is represented as a longer tree. Well, this is getting harder to make sense of, but here we can have Robbie follow this strategy. Okay, here he is. He says, if north is empty and there's a can to my east, well, that's true, so follow this first branch. But now this first branch has another if statement. So we look at this. If it's both true that there's not a can to my west, so there's no can to the west, and there is a can to the east, then, well, this is true, so we follow the first branch of this, move east. There he is. Now we're in a new situation. So start up here, say, is there is the north empty, and is there a can to the east? No. So we go over here to this final branch, and we say, if there's a can in the current site, there is, pick up the can. He does it. OK, well, now he's in the situation where this first, this if clause fails. It's not true. So we go over here. There's not a current can in his site, so he has to move south. I hope you get the idea that this is just a different way to express a strategy. It's hard to find a tree that is a good strategy, but that's going to be the job of the genetic algorithm. The only difference from what we did before is that the genetic algorithm is going to evolve these trees instead of strings. So here's how that works. The initial population, instead of a set of random strings, is just a set of random trees with some what we call syntactic constraints. For example, we need an if-else at the root of the tree and some other constraints. I'm not going to talk about the details of that here. I just want you to get the general idea. To calculate fitness, well, it's the same procedure. We have Robbie try out each strategy in a variety of environments, compute each strategy's average score, and then we have the fitter individuals get to create more offspring than the less fit individuals. That implements selection. 
to do crossover to produce children, instead of exchanging parts of strings, we exchange subtrees. So here's an example. Here's two possible parents, two trees. And we might create a child by taking this subtree from the second parent and putting it here instead of this move east node here. We would put this subtree there to create a child who looked like this. So here, this is exactly the same as this first parent, except for that move east block is replaced by this if else block. It's still a syntactically correct tree. It's still a strategy. And this is how the genetic algorithm is able to take parts of fit parents and recombine them. Mutation, instead of replacing a randomly chosen value by another random value, we replace a subtree by a randomly generated subtree. So we might do this. We might take this subtree here and replace it by some randomly generated subtree. I didn't implement a genetic programming version of Robbie. That's something that the more advanced programmers among you might be interested in doing. But I do want to tell you about a real genetic programming project, actually two of them, that are quite interesting. The first one is applying genetic programming to computer graphics. This has been done by a lot of people. The most famous example was done by Carl Sims. Here he is in the 1990s. He's a computer graphics artist and decided to evolve programs to produce computer graphics that are aesthetically pleasing. So here's how that works. The individuals in the population are trees, just like I showed you, except instead of representing strategies for a virtual robot, they represent equations that generate a color for each pixel in an image. OK, so this is just some examples. And these are some programs. So I'm not going to explain to you how this works. You can read Carl Sims' paper if you're interested. But just come away with, with the idea that you can represent these programs as trees. And each program generates a color for every pixel in the image. OK, so you can imagine generating a bunch of random programs that randomly color the pixels in the image. The question is, how do you define a fitness function? That is, how do you define the fitness of a particular picture? Well, this is something that right now is beyond computers to do well. So Carl Sims had humans in the loop. What he did was have humans, himself as an example, look at pictures that the computer created, random pictures, and pick the one that he liked the best then that one would be used as a parent and via crossover with other random programs and mutation, it would produce new programs that would produce new images that are related to the one that he chose. And he would repeat this over and over again. And the genetic algorithm came up with some very beautiful results. So here's an example. Here's a picture and here's a program that created it. So this was a collaboration, in some sense, between the genetic algorithm and a human, where the human is not actually writing the program, but just saying what he or she likes. And then the genetic algorithm goes and evolves that program further. Here's another example, and another one. Here's a particularly beautiful one very reminiscent of some Japanese paintings, I think. Another one, and it goes on and on. Here are two uh, URLs you can go to. The first is to Carl Sims' website, where he shows all of these pictures and talks about a lot of his different projects. The second one is a applet, which gives you the opportunity to evolve these kinds of pictures yourself. One really interesting thing that Carl Sims did, in addition to what I've just described, is to set up a museum exhibit. This one was at the Georges Pompidou Center in Paris, where he had a series of monitors, as you can see, each showing a different picture of the kind that we just looked at. 
And down here on the floor are sensors. And the people in the exhibit can go and stand on the sensors if they like a particular picture. And then that one gets chosen and gets evolved further via the genetic algorithm, perhaps mating with some of the other chosen pictures. So in that way, it wasn't just a single person, but it was a whole group of people who were, in some sense, playing the role of the selection algorithm for the genetic algorithm. Here's what Sims said about this. The viewers at this exhibit can observe a computer simulated evolution in progress, an evolution of images. But in this evolution, the viewers are not just observers. They cause the evolution and direct its course. And he goes on to say, a population of images is displayed by the computer on an arc of 16 video screens. The viewers determine which images will survive by standing on sensors in front of those they think are the most aesthetically interesting. The pictures that are not selected are removed and replaced by offspring from the surviving images. The new images are copies and combinations of their parents, but with various alterations. This is an artificial evolution in which the viewers themselves interactively determine the fitness of the pictures by choosing where they stand. As this cycle continues, the population of images can progress towards more and more interesting visual effects. This interactive installation is an unusual collaboration between humans and machines. The humans supply decisions of visual aesthetics, and the computer supplies the mathematical ability for generating, mating, and mutating complex textures and patterns. The viewers are not required to understand the technical equations involved. The computer can only experiment at random with no sense of aesthetics, but the combination of human and machine abilities permits the creation of results that neither of the two could produce alone.